Great, it's lovely to see people from all over Europe and uh, different uh, different interests in in trails. Whether you're from parks or other organisations, um, yeah, it's lovely to have you with us today. Oh, from uh, then oh, it's hard to they're coming in so thick and fast. It's hard to read. Uh, we've gone from the north to the south of Europe in in two meeting two uh, clicks. Okay, so whilst you're doing that, I'll just go through a couple of little bits of housekeeping before we start. So as I said, uh, for those of you who have just joined, uh, please feel free, if you wish to do so, to keep your video cameras on. We love to see you in our webinars uh, uh, with Europark. Uh, you will find that your uh, uh, microphones are indeed muted, uh, but we will give you permission to speak if you have a question or a point you, you wish to raise. So um, if you do have a question for the speakers, then please uh, use the reactions um, in Zoom. So you can either raise the hand or or basically just stand and wave and one of us will see you if uh, if, you, if, if you have a burning question that you wish to ask the, uh, um, ask the speakers. So um, furthermore, if you do have questions, um, as you're thinking about them, again, please feel free to put them in the chat box and my colleague Simona will be monitoring that. And uh, if we see some questions there again, if there's time, we will put them to the um, to our speakers. So whilst you're all just introducing yourself, I will just do some general introductions to our webinar this morning. So just give me a second whilst I share screen. Okay, so. Is everyone seeing my screen? And I'll put it on to full presentation mode just in a second. Someone give me a thumbs up that that's okay. Good, thank you very much. So, as I said, just as you, for those who are just coming in, welcome to our webinar, Connecting Nature and People, the Transformative Power of Trails. And this is very much a precursor to the World Trails Congress, which you're going to hear about just shortly. It's being held in Ottawa in Canada. You're going to hear some exciting news about that just in a moment. But this is sort of at the European end of that, just for us in the European side uh, to consider trails from our perspective and, and the importance of trails in our parks and protected areas and in the wider landscape. Um, this webinar is being hosted by the Europark Federation. Europark is the representative body and network uh, organisation for parks and protected areas across Europe. We have about 40 mem 400 members in 40 countries, and that represents thousands of parks and protected areas of every kind and of every designation. And we very much welcome uh, Europark members amongst our audience uh, today. So we are here to support our parks and protected areas by helping them to pr protect nature by promoting sustainability. And we do all of that by bringing people together, whether it's live in workshops and conferences or here uh, online in our webinar today. Our parks and protected areas of Europe are places for nature. Now trails can bring us very close to nature and to wild spaces, especially if they're been well designed and well planned. But trails can also be overused and poorly placed and cause disturbance and inadvertently destruction to, to wildlife and to nature. But good trails can indeed transform nature and our relationship with it. Our parks and protected areas are places that are important for climate change adaptation and mitigation. Our parks are not just valuable uh, biodiversity reservoirs, they're also important carbon sinks as well. So the trails have a very important role in general across the landscape as an infrastructure to get us from A to B. Uh, they're also important, of course, both in and around protected areas, as well as to enable us to get uh, to and from them. Trails can make us much less reliant on cars and provide alternative transport options like biking. So good trails can transform mobility. Our parks and protected areas, I think, of course, are places that do sustain us, our mental or physical health. Trails enable us to get to those places that we need uh, to nurture and nourish our souls. So trails are good for our health and well-being. 
trails help us escape. Now, Europark has the Charter for Sustainable Tourism in protected areas, and we have hundreds of parks and partners working to have a more sustainable approach to, to tourism, because trails can bring positive experiences both for the visitors and indeed for the communities as well. So trails can be very good for the local economy. So trails are important for parks and protected areas, both within, out with them, and indeed between them. They can be that network of connectivity um, for people and for nature. Because every journey begins with a single step and we weave ourselves across the landscapes through trails that connect us to each other and to nature. And indeed to the history and to the culture of our places, especially in Europe, our, our paths often have a very historic sense of belonging in, in, the, in the landscape. Our trails have the power to heal, to protect, to transform us as, as individuals when we go deep into nature. And indeed, the economic and social benefits of trails can transform communities. And through the choices we make, good and well-planned and well-managed trails can take us and lead us into very many different directions. So today we're really going to consider and discuss the importance of trails, particularly in Europe, but we will take an eye to the more international um, aspects as well and to see how we can capitalise on their values to transform nature and people. Consider the words of Pythagoras. He's invited us to leave the road, to leave our structures and our formalities and take the trail, take the trails and, and be perhaps be more spontaneous and, and be more uh, considered in, uh, in our relationship uh, with nature. So, You've heard a few words of introduction from me. You're certainly going to hear a lot more words from our very esteemed speakers. But first of all, I'd like to hear from you. And I'm sure you're all familiar now, hopefully, with Menti. If you're not, uh, this is your introduction to it. And either with your phone or using uh, another device or opening a, a new tab on your laptop, um, you'll see the go to menti.com and follow that code there, 19295126, or Hold up your QR screen, screener to the to the screen there and um, use the QR code and that will take you into the Menti. And there you'll find this question asking you, what are the three things that trails provide for people in nature? From your perspective, what is it that trails are important? What is important about trails? So I invite you just in a couple of minutes to offer some thoughts on that. And um, I look forward in a moment to seeing um, what, what those thoughts are. So I'll just stop sharing screen there and I'll need to move into the Menti. So if you just give me a second to do that. So while you're considering what are the three things that trails provide for people and for nature, hopefully you've managed to find your way into the Menti. If not, if you have any uh, queries or questions, please put them in the chat and we'll endeavour to direct you uh, into the Menti. Obviously, you're all using different devices, so it's quite hard for us to know sometimes uh, what your issues might be. But if you're having a problem getting in there, let us know and we shall try and solve, solve that for you. So what are the three important things for that, that you think that trails are for in nature? Hi, Esther. You're still muted. Simone will mute you in a, in a, in a moment. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to say that there's a different question in the, in the Menti link. Not sure if that's a big issue. It's about what do trails deliver for nature protection and climate change adaptation? Oh, that's the second one, yeah. Let me just see what, what's happening. There's going to be two Mentis, and the first one is the one I was just mentioning, and that one. But that's fine. If you're answering that one now, that's great. We'll do it in the reverse order. Um, so, yeah, what do trails deliver for nature protection and climate change? Great. Knock yourselves out. I'm happy to, uh, to, to hear your thoughts on that as well. But I'll come back to the other word cloud in a moment. But uh, that's the one that should have opened up first. But that's fine. They're... We'll take them in any order. 
So the one that most people are now uh, have, have entered is what do trails deliver for nature protection and climate change adaptation or mitigation? Is that correct? I can see some general nods in the room. So I'm going to leave you to work on that in the background because I'm sure you'll get some inspiration and some thoughts uh, from our speakers. Because as I mentioned there, parks and protected areas, I think, have a very important role to play in terms of the uh, connectivity and the provision of trails across Europe. So we're going to dive straight into one of those parks and protected areas. And we're going to head over to Austria and we're going to meet Herbert Folger, the director of the Gesalsa National Park in Austria. Herbert is a forest engineer and the director of the park. And he's very interested in regional cooperation and, of course, in connecting nature and the communities and regions around his national park. He's one of the initiators of the Lynx Trail, and he's going to tell us more about it now. So, Herbert, I'm going to hand over to you for the Lynx Trail. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Okay, I hope you have got my presentation on the on your screens. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, yes, welcome to the Lax Trail. The Lax Trail is an 11 day hiking trail in the wild heart of Austria and passes through three large protected areas and through Austria's first and only UNESCO World Natural Heritage Site, which is a beech forest. The area is also recognized by the Alpine Convention as a pilot region for ecological connectivity. Okay, my slide stops here. Yeah. Okay, the slide was faster than me. Uh, Hollywood is great in films. Central Austria is great in landscape. It's also great in hiking, in protected areas. We have a, a good density of protected areas and of course in habitat quality for the lynx. Our region, our region is uh, what we call Großes Kino in Germany, great cinema. The landscape has unspoiled woodlands and mountain wilderness. Where are we? Quite in the uh, center of Europe and uh, also in the center of Austria. Let's have a closer look. There's the three protected areas, National Park Kalkalten, National Park Gesäuse, and the wilderness area of Dürrenstein. And this area is also the home of seven lynxes, the only inner Austrian occurrence of lynxes and a very fragile one. The lynx was in our area until 200 years ago. And the, the lynxes were very present in the region. And 150 years ago, the last lynx was killed. Those pictures, by the way, are from the uh, library of the monastery of uh, Atmont. Uh, they are from uh, 70 something from the 18th century and uh, the trail passes right through Atmont. So it's a place you can see uh, when you are on the Langs Trail. But let's go to the present. In 1996, a Langs appeared in the region. It is unknown where it came from. Uh, there was still a, uh, or say in the, in, in the Carpathians in Eastern Austria, uh, Europe, Lanxes never vanished, but there was also a private uh, non-official uh, reintroduction in Austria in the 70s, where also it might be that this one first Lanx came from. In 2011, the National Park Kalkalten started a reintroduction program, and this was very successful until 2018. Since then, there's no reproduction and several animals were literally killed. So that was time for action. Let's go back to this map and the three 
the three uh, protected areas. We three had some uh, experience in uh, projects of uh, establishing corridors for, an, for animals to move between those uh, protected areas. And uh, we decided in 2018 to develop a hiking trail to connect our protected areas and we dedicated the trail to the lynx. The proposition was to raise awareness for the lynxes and by creating income for small family owned businesses in remote areas, the trail was well accepted from the beginning. To anticipate the outcome regarding lynxes, a new release project is discussed by the public and authorities right now. So uh, we see um, it could be a success story for nature protection. And the trail is already a success story for hiking. What we learned, for example, is that a good trail needs a good start and a strong finish. We start in Reichraming, which uh, hikers can reach by public transport, and we finish in the house of the wilderness, the exhibition center of the wilderness area. On this slide, you see our main goals, and to reach those two goals, three elements were necessary. Most important is story. What is the story told by the trail? The lynx is a symbol of the mystery of wilderness. The trail follows ecological stepping stones created for the lynx and takes you right through its habitat. You can feel its presence. The trail can give you a spiritual connection with wilderness and reawakens your need for primal connection with nature. Hikers on the trail are in the presence of something wonderful, even if they don't see the lynx. We are talking at least between the lines of wilderness, so uh, we decided to choose a photographic language which is somehow wild. So in this picture you see clouds, you see rain, dark colors, steep mountains, deep forests, nothing really typical in touristic marketing. Let us see two other examples. Here the steep mountains look also a little bit more dangerous or a hiking photo in dark colors. And uh, for me, as one of the founders of the trail, from the beginning, professional development, uh, trail design and management was very, very important. We had a partner with the Trail Angels, uh, which is a team of hiking specialists in the Austrian Alps based in Carinthia. They took part in the planning of the trail and they also run a booking center which is called Book Your Trail, which allows individual booking of the trail. And what can you book? You can book, of course, boarding that might be a, a mountain hut uh, or, or a good hotel. So it depends on some, uh, in some days you can choose. In some days, there's only one uh, possibility. You can book dinner, you can book uh, luggage transport, shuttle services, you can book special, uh, specialized guides and special packages. Like here on this slide on the right, you see Lunx Trail in search of the Lunx. This is one of those special uh, uh, packages. Um, it's a package, package where you uh, go with a, a national park uh, ranger uh, in search of the Lunx. On the left side, that's the booking dashboard. Here you can check online the availability of beds and accommodation. You can check prices and you can also book. What else is the booking center doing? The booking center acts as information center. There's a hotline to solve problems of hikers on the trail, at least when there is telephone signal, that's not uh, in every moment. So. What do hikers on the on the trail have questions for? Like, uh, 
I ran out of medicine, where is the next pharmacy? Or I'm on a, on a crossing, do I have to turn left or right? And uh, several other type of questions. So speaking of information, one of our achievements this really was a very good media response. We had a lot of, of articles published, like this one, and they say articles are not paid advertisements. Please notice the two pictures, the photographs in this article. So it, that's a huge, a big photograph of the lungs and the smaller one of the hikers. So that's how we try to, uh, to place the, the white. Another achievement is support, ideological and also financial support for the monitoring of the lungs. The booking company dedicates a certain percentage of the turnover to the monitoring. And on this picture, we see some trail partners at one of our meetings. People there, they run mountain huts, they run restaurants, accommodation, or taxis. And uh, also participating in those uh, discussions are official tourism agencies, which are organized by Australian law. So Keda, we are stronger, of course. So summing up, it's all about connecting. It's about connecting protected areas, one to each other, about connecting people and nature, about connecting nature protection and regional development, and connecting slow tourism and professional management. So I would say the Lax Trail is a platform where Alpine clubs, tourism agencies, tourists, communities and protected areas cooperate. Thank you. Uh, I've come to the end of my presentation, but the nice thing is it's not the end of the Lurks Trail of the, our project. We will connect another protected area, which is uh, the Nature Park Butcher, and add do more hiking days, days. So in the future, it will be not 11, but 13 days. So thank you for listening and watching. And of course, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for taking us on that cinematic tour of central Austria. It was uh, it was beautiful to, to look at. Uh, for those of you who want to find out more about the Lynx Trail, the, the, link, the link for the Lynx Trail is now in the chat. Um, I might also ask, I know there's representatives from Trail Angels here in the audience, I might ask you to also add your website uh, or your contact details and website to the uh, chat there. Because um, I think the, the service that you offer and the relationship that you have certainly with the Lynx Trail is a great model and something I think protected areas um, across Europe would really benefit from and really be interested in. So so Trail Angels, I'll come back to you because I think you've got a really important service and, and uh, something to, to add to our protected areas uh, community. I, I'm sorry I don't have time for you today. If, if we keep super, super to time, I might invite you uh, back in in a wee moment. But I'm just taking a quick look um, on the chat to see if there's any questions for Herbert. We're just going to take a quick look, see if there's any sort of a common questions. OK, there's a couple there. Um, Herbert, how are you measuring the number of visitors on the trail? Um, and have you seen any increase in the use of it since you've begun your marketing and promotion of the trail? Yes, we have uh, a number uh, of those visitors who book through the uh, booking company, trail angels. And uh, then we uh, speak to the boarding houses and ask them uh, what is the percentage between uh, uh, clients who come by the booking center and other ones. Uh, so we know that about 10 to 20% book by the booking centers and uh, more than 80% book uh, by themselves on their own. Um, our boarding houses know quite, 
quite well uh, who is a, a long trail uh, hiker and who is uh, say just a normal day hiker because those with the long trail they either uh, say I'm on the long trail or they have a really big huge rucksack or <laughs> they have a sign uh, long trail I'm walking the long trail so it's about 10 to 20 percent booked by the agency and uh, 80 percent a little bit more uh, by themselves. Great. Um, one final question from me with regards to the trails themselves, you talked about this connectivity between the communities and the region. Um, we're assuming that these are not new trails that were put in especially as the Lynx Trail. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about the history of the trail and, and their, you know, their space in the in the landscape as a, cult, a piece of the cultural landscape, you know, these older trails that have become part of the Lynx Trail. Yes, our area was inhabited by uh, hunters and by uh, people who lived in and in the forest and on farms. And there was a lot of trails uh, used by those people. Uh, I would say excuse, exclusively uh, used by those people until around about 1900. Uh, and uh, our area was opened uh, with a railway in 1870. And uh, after that, uh, tourism started. And uh, tourism started and tourists took over uh, those trails. And uh, all the official trails we have today are old hunting or, um, or forester trails. So it's uh, old traditional trails. The funny thing is that tourists now keep those trails open because hunting and uh, uh, forest purposes are uh, do not take place on those walking tra hiking trails, but on forest roads. So we use old traditional roads and uh, we keep them as hiking trails. Great. I think that's very much a feature of our European landscape, isn't it? That, that we're reusing some of those old traditional routes that connected uh, people in, in times gone by and, and have been repurposed. Uh, for 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 visitation, and I'm sure there are plenty of examples of similarly uh, across uh, across Europe. Some of the specific um, questions that are coming up, I'm sure Herbert, if you can pop into the chat, some people are asking about how long is the trail and such and such, and I'm sure you can answer those questions directly. But in the meantime, we're going to jump out of Europe and we're going to go a bit further afield and head over to Canada. As I briefly mentioned earlier, Canada is hosting the World Tra Trails Conference this year, and I'm very lucky to be given an invitation to speak there, so I'm looking forward to, to, my, uh, to going there myself. Um, but we're also very lucky to have with us today uh, Mateo Rao, Roy, sorry, the Chief Executive Officer at the Trans-Canada Trail. Now, we think we've got some pretty long trails in Europe. Well, my goodness me, the Trans-Canada Trail uh, will outstrip all of ours. Um, so, Mateo, if I could hand over to you to tell us more about uh, the Trans-Canada Trail, but of course, invite us to the World Trails Conference as well. Hand over to you, Mateo. Thank you, Carol. Let me share my screen. So, can everyone can see it? Yeah, perfect. So, my name is Mateo Hua. I'm the CEO of Trans-Canada Trail. I'm speaking to you from MAGA, Quebec, in Canada, uh, the trail, the Trans-Canada Trail is on Turtle Island, which is the indigenous territories of many nations, Métis people across our country. The theme of the webinar today is really there to the art of Trans-Canada Trail. Connection is all about what we do, what we are. Uh, we started in 1992 to try to connect the entire country with one trail network. Up to 2017, we worked towards that connection. Since then, uh, we are working with community, people, nature, places. So our role is really to connect people to nature and to one another. Today, I will share with 10, 10 minutes-ish a bit about our work, what we do to connect people, places, and, and the planet, and how we gather data to really support 
our vision, our mission. So a bit about the Trans-Canada Trail, as Carol mentioned, it's a pretty long trail network. It's span over 28,000 kilometers from coast to coast to coast. So we connect the Arctic Ocean to the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. We are also on Baffin Island. So if you can see on the, the map there, the small little line there, it's in United, one of our further territories. 80% of the Canadian population live within 30 minutes of the trail. We connect national uh, park, provincial park, urban park, conservation area, also connect biosphere and UNESCO site. So we touch a lot of places, but we are in every capitals of the province. So this means that we are in a major urban center and we play a very unique role of connecting, of being that first connector of people with nature. We work to maintain this network with 600 trail, local trail. And as I mentioned earlier, the connection, the power of regeneration of nature is part of our vision. We want everyone to embrace the outdoor, connect with one another, and experience the restorative power of nature. And we do that through collaboration and partnership. We cannot achieve this project, 28,000 kilometers, without partners. And we, we are partnering with the DMO, so the Destination Canada of this world, uh, to do regenerative tourism, but also with Park Canada to ensure that we align our messaging, we align our program, and uh, provide the best connection to nature to people. And what is our role with 600 more trail partners? How we can keep them engaged? Uh, I would say we are for a trail organization, a pretty big trail organization. Uh, we have 50 staff, uh, but at the same time, across the country, when you divide the numbers of staff by the numbers of trail organization, it is not that much. So really what we do to support our trail is advocate, steward, and provide resources, funding, guidance, leadership to trail organization. And we do that from different perspective. When we think about the sustainability, the residency of our trail system, we really want to support the trail organization that manage locally the trail. We know we have an aging volunteer population right now. That aging volunteer population need to be replaced in some shape or form. So we need to find new volunteers and engage the young generation in stewarding trail and taking care of trail. We're looking at the economic side, the regenerative tourism side, the indigenous reconciliation, which is super important for us. That leads us to cultural preservation of some, and the role of trail could play with, within that. And one of the big challenge that we are facing in Canada is the trail adaptation to climate change. So if I give you an example, the 28,000 kilometers, We've seen it all, from permafrost melting to wildfire to coastal erosion to drought uh, across and creating water retention basin to for irrigation that will that are flooding trail and flash flood. It's all over the place. It's happening all the time. What is the role of our organization? It's really to gather the best practices, the knowledge the data for the trail organization locally to be able to, yes, adapt their trail, but also put in place the visitor use management system to reduce the impact on the population, the local community, and nature itself. So when you think about the, the wildfire, for example, last summer was the worst season that we have seen in Canada over the, the last 25 years that created a change in the management of trail. The trail were open very early on. You needed to have a major rescue plan because people were still going in nature. And you needed to have staff to empty the, the bin, the garbage bin, or open, open the, uh, the washroom for people. 
So it was a very a big change in management process to make sure that people can access and teach well. We are also doing tons of research and consultation. We all know, I underscore that money is a key factor to be successful in the residency. You, you can help trail organization, provide education program, but at one point we need funding to put in place adaptation measure for our infrastructure. The Trans-Canada Trail is mainly built on former rail bed. Uh, so those former rail line are 100 years old and more as infrastructure. So the bridge, the trestle, a lot of things are falling apart and we need to repair it. But to convince our elected official to invest in trail as a recreative product, as an education product, we need to provide some benefit about the trail itself. We look at this from different perspective. The first one is really how it help people to connect with nature, to do physical activity, and to have that social connection. From our study, we know that 2.6 million people are using the Trans-Canada Trail to do at least 150 minutes of physical activities a week. That's a lot of person when you think about the, the population of Canada, that it's around 40 million people. So we keep big chunk of our population active. When we ask people why they use trail, 94% of them talk about their mental health and their well-being. 97% speak about the connection with nature. And when you ask if it adds value into their life and their community, 89% tell us yes. Those are big numbers. But what we see is that whatever partisan on, on political side you are, you're gonna reach a consensus of investing in trail because each politician will see their constituent into these numbers. It's also a big opportunity for us to look at how can we educate people about conservation and preservation and cultural preservation. So for, it's a good number to advocate for advocacy, but it's also good numbers as opportunity and strategic planning. We also look at the financial. Now it gets good to say 97% use it for their well-being, but what does, does the trail bring to our people? The trail supports 220,000 jobs each year across the country. 23 billion of economic impact. So the infrastructure itself support the local businesses, small businesses, tourism operator along the, the trail, and it really generate revenue for communities. We're looking at people making exercise, so 1.7 billion in healthcare sa savings, 62 billion in mental healthcare saving a year. And one thing that it's very important for us because we are an urban center, it provides environmental services. So the environmental services and urban center, the trail, create this green buffer. If the trail is not there, we're losing that green buffer. And without the, this green space, community would have to invest money to recharge the, the water table or prevent to flood, mit flood mitigation. We also work a lot which create, bring to our trail organization new tech, new way to do things. Uh, one partnership we develop is to track people, and I put that in form art, it's ethical tracking, but to collect data to get the visitation on trail. So people can provide to their constituent, their decision maker, information about the trail usage. We have a trail visitation report that was created for local trail, but we also look at what are what is the number, the big number of the Trans-Canada Trail with people coming from and exiting from all over the place. We're looking for 2000, uh, 2022 at 240 million daily visit for the Trans-Canada Trail itself during a year. 
12.5 unique visitors. For us, those numbers are speaking because we know that people are coming once, but multiple times through the year. There are, it's about 20, each person visit the trail about 20 times during a year. So it's very important. I could do a full webinar just on this trail visitation report, and I'm happy to share more detail with you in the near future. Do not hesitate to contact me. But I want to take the time to invite you to the World Trail Conference. We're really pleased to host this international gathering of trail experts and also conservation experts in Canada. It is the first time that it, it is hosted in Canada. Uh, it's a World Trail Network Conference. It's happened every two years. It's going to be from September 30 to October 3rd. You're all invited. Uh, our friend Kyle Ritchie will be one of the keynote speakers. We're going to speak about regenerative tourism, conservation and trail, and the role that we can add and the value that we are adding. And also the resiliency of the trail sector, making sure that we have the information, the data, the support to improve our trail network and sustain it for a long time. So come visit us in Canada. You're always welcome. If you want to email me, my contact is there. Happy to take any question. Thank you so much. And thank you for, well, just blowing our minds with those numbers. I mean, we would have to circumnavigate uh, Europe multiple times to make 28,000 uh, uh, kilometers and uh, 200 million visits. Uh, you know, it's like half the population of uh, Europe all turning up on our trails at the same time. So, um, great. But I think it also shows the power of numbers. But not just the power of gen of gathering the numbers, but of of really being forensic in what numbers we are gathering and how we're directing and using that information, as you said, uh, to gain political support and and the funding that follows thereafter. I'm going to hold fire on questions now because we're going to jump in uh, to speak to Julian in, in a moment. But I'm giving the audience the opportunity to consider your your uh, inputs. And uh, if you have any questions, to put them in the chat just now. Whilst we jump over to Julian Gray. And Julian is the vice chair of the World Trails Network. Uh, but more locally, he is the chair of National Trail UK and even more locally of the Southwest Coast Path Association. So Julian really is a trails guy from the local path right up to the, the global uh, uh, perspective. So, Jill, Jillian, perhaps you could share with us some of your thoughts about trails and sustainable development. Thank you, Carol. And yes, uh, following uh, those kind of numbers, it's a difficult act to follow, Matthew. Thanks for that. So hopefully you can see my screen. There we go. So I'm going to uh, talk about trails and sustainable development and really picking up from the, the last point that um, Mathieu was uh, talking about, which is the World Trails Conference. And really, we, we've we've been having a conversation around trails and sustainability uh, for the past four years or so within the World Trails Network, and very specifically uh, through the Trails and Sustainability Task Team. So the, the World Trails Network has, has a number of different task teams, and this one has been really trying to drive the conversation and thoughts forward um, about uh, trails and sustain sustainability, uh, starting uh, with the uh, 2018 World Trails Conference in Santiago uh, on the on the uh, Camino, and uh, at that conference, uh, Nat Scrimshaw, who is the president of the Pan American Trails Network or the World Trails Network Hub for the Americas, uh, pulled together a group of people who are interested in sustainability uh, and co-chaired by Andras Molnar from Hungary. And we really started to look at how we could, number one, define trails and sustainability, and number two, see how we could use that. So we, um, first of all, we did a, uh, a global survey to look at trails and sustainability to get some baseline data of what trail managers perceived as sustainability and also perceived as issues, opportunities, threats, etc. Uh, that was in 2019. We then um, started to develop a theoretical framework 
uh, around the idea of uh, trails and sustainability. Um, and we started right at the beginning of the, uh, with the Brundtland definition of sustainable development. Uh, and then we started to working with academics and trail managers to uh, think more widely. So first of all, looking at the, um, the sustainable development goals, could we articulate the benefits of trails through the lens of um, the uh, sustainable development goals? And that's still a, a, an, an ambition of the World Trails Network to produce a report which clearly articulates uh, those public benefits uh, through that through that lens. Then also more recently, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, looking through the lens of people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership. And really, the purpose of this was to help drive uh, the work of the task team uh, to move conversation forward. Now, we had an interesting opportunity in uh, 2020 where we had the um, um, COP26, which has been hosted in the UK on the Southwest Coast Path uh, National Trail, which is a local trail I, I work on. And we leave this opportunity to host a trail summit, looking at sustainability through the lens of climate change. And this helped underpin our emerging white paper. So we've, we've been working on, on a white paper, which I'll come on to in a second. So um, the theoretical framework kind of grew from the original three pillars that we um, uh, kind of uh, from the Brundtland Commission and really started to look at other aspects and other ways of, of viewing sustainability in trails. Um, and this has also then been mirrored in um, uh, not only the theoretical framework, but also developing a, uh, a, a way of assessing trails and developing trails from a sustainability perspective. So looking at the, um, uh, the kind of trails from a whole series of different perspectives. So here, this is an example of where we're looking at, say, the difference between uh, lo local uh, fine grain through to global and a coarse grain and wild and urban. Same issues, looking at the, the same kind of uh, the same pillars of environment, economy and society. But when you then drill through the, the detail changes and the conversation changes and the opportunities changes. And what's happened is that we've developed a toolbox, uh, which I don't have time to talk about today. It's going to, it would take way too long. But this sustainability toolbox is a resource which uh, has been re really driven by the sustainability task team and also the knowledge task team. Uh, and it's a resource to help trails uh, understand what the opportunities are, what the benefits are, what, what the risks are in developing trails, and also collecting a lot of uh, not just uh, peer-reviewed uh, research, but also grey information as well. So uh, if you want to find out more about the toolbox, please come along to the conference because uh, Andres will talk about it there in great detail. Um, so one of the things that we um, also uh, wanted to do was, if I just zip back up a, a, a slide here, in, in 2020, we decided to try and develop this uh, Trail Making Rapid Assessment uh, process, TRAMP, uh, which was a very bad uh, um, and, uh, um, acronym, apologies for that. Uh, but, but the idea was to go and try and use this as a, as a way of engaging with communities and building a trail in a sustainable way. We did a uh, our first ex expedition in Costa Rica, uh, or, um, developing or trailblazing a, a trail uh, down from the cloud forest to the, to the Pacific coast using this methodology in February 2020, which felt very positive. Unfortunately, we, when we arrived back in uh, Europe, um, other things had happened and uh, the pandemic took over. So that, that put a bit of a, uh, a, a delay in our work. But one of the things the pandemic did do is it shifted the kind of the, the paradigm and the perception of trails being uh, solitary activities where people were either trying to find themselves or run away from things to being one of the few social places where people could actually uh, be sociable under virus control measures, which is which is quite interesting how that perception has changed. Uh, and hopefully uh, that perception has changed for the good as well. Um, we've seen far, far more people going regularly out on trails. And I think that also uh, is borne out in Mathieu's figures of the repeat visits coming through on trails, which has, has been growing. So um, in 2022, we uh, took uh, 
the ideas and the thoughts that we'd had uh, to the World Trails Conference in Skiathos um, in, under the guise of a Trails and Sustainability white paper. And within the white paper, really, it was trying to draw together uh, all the, the theoretical work we'd done and the work we'd done on TRAMP and to uh, test whether we, were, whether we were actually developing tools which were useful and also to uh, show the first uh, version of the of the sustainability uh, um, trails toolbox. So um, historically, um, trails in protected landscapes have been viewed with kind of wariness, um, and specifically being people management issues into special and fragile places. And so, what we wanted to try and do in the white paper is to kind of look at opportunities and examples where trails are being used to address modern challenges uh, facing us all uh, and see trails as beacons of sustainability and exemplars of nature recovery. So uh, that's where the, the white paper is kind of, of, has, has moved and, and it sets out uh, the impacts of trails across the environment, society and the economy. Um, hopefully you're able to read the slides rather than me read them out loud to you so that gives the kind of the, the, the kind of some of the, the thoughts behind our the theoretical framework so something that was picked up um by carol and also by Mathieu was the importance of being able to articulate the public benefit of trails and this was also this came out of the uh, uh sustainability test team and we really wanted to be able to engage with uh, people at a political level to be able to show what 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 the benefits were and Matthew has just done a fantastic job with his numbers and uh, we're not going to compete with those numbers um but it but it really helps because we over, over the years I think we all know the benefits of trails but we really haven't been good at engaging at, at a public discourse level and uh, um, at a government level at, at really kind of persuading governments that they need to invest in trails because they are amazing value for money. So, um, and the other thing that we, we, we've got is we've got a climate crisis and we've got a nature crisis and we've got a, a in the UK and I'm presuming more, more widely, we have a cost of living crisis and all of those mean that our costs are going up. Uh, and the public purse isn't necessarily getting any bigger, so we need to argue better to be able to get funding for trails. Um, we've also got a broader uh, issue of the whole kind of food, water, kind of energy and health nexus, and the negative impact on our health and on the environment, and and that and trails can really help uh, support that. So what I want to do is to look at. That theoretical framework in a, in, in, a, in a, a trail, um, or an example of a trail. So I'm going to pick the southwest coast path because it's a trail I know best. So this is a trail in the southwest of the UK with a thousand kilometres long, so uh, a lot shorter than uh, Mathieu. Um, but we are a national trail. We've been uh, around for about 50 years, although people have walked around the coast for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it takes about two months to walk the trail. Although most people take about 40 years, they do it in sections. Uh, although there are a few people who run uh, manically and the fastest known time, if you're interested, is 10 days and eight hours. So that's basically uh, running 23 hours a day at about four miles an hour and sleeping one hour a day, eating lots of custard and avocados. Um, so looking at the, uh, um, the Southwest Coast Path, the first thing that uh, the first kind of data that we we've got is that we know it's saving just in terms of people being a little bit more healthy because they're walking along the trail. It's saving our public health sector seventy five million a year in terms of physical health benefits, and the mental health benefits are looking to be uh, we're, we're assessing those at the moment. But it looks like those numbers are also similar. We've also um, in terms of uh, visits, we get nine million visits. Um, which is 5% of the visitor economy of Southwest England, which brings in about over 500 million pounds into the visitor economy. So in terms of just tax to those um, uh, tourism businesses, it puts about 100 million back into the treasury, back into government. Uh, and that supports about 11,000 jobs. So these are important numbers. It's, it's, the trail has a real impact on the local economy. 
And the challenge for us is turning it from a sustainable economy into a regenerative economy. Right, I'm rapidly running out of time here. Um, so finally, just want to look at kind of uh, nature recovery and uh, trails. And I'll use the example of the England Coast Path. So here we have a brand new trail that is getting designated as we speak. Um, it, the designation process or the, the act to create the England Coast Path started in, uh, was, was uh, passed in 2009. Whoops. Uh, and uh, it's 2,700 miles long or will be when it's finished. And it will also include an area called Coastal Margin, which is 800 square miles of uh, open access land between the trail and the coast, uh, mean low water. So this is a fantastic opportunity for us to, number one, talk about trail corridors, because we have a defined trail corridor here. Number two, to think of a trail as a protected landscape, because it is 800 square miles is the size of a decent sized IUCN class five landscape in the UK and one of the national parks. Um, and it's also an opportunity for us to use the trail as a beacon to drive uh, um, nature recovery along that uh, trail corridor to better connect people to nature. And we've started a project called the Coastal Wild Belt. So this will be an 800 square mile area. Um, at the moment, we're very much in our scoping year. So this is really early days. And um, by March next year, we should have a better idea of exactly what we can do. But we're really looking to try and take that 800 square miles and drive it for uh, sustainable development and for nature recovery and for connecting people to nature. I'm very happy to answer questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Julian, for that whistle stop uh, tour of uh, the links between sustainability and trails. And I hope that's a. Uh inspire some thoughts in, in your minds across uh, Europe and uh, globally about how you would kind of reframe your trails along the, the lines, literally along the roots of uh, sustainability using the sustainable development goals. I think there's some interesting work there to be done. I think too, again, Julian has reminded us of the power of numbers. And I think we'll come back to that theme uh, just shortly. Um, Julian, there is a specific question in the chat for you that I'm going to leave you to answer uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But I think I've got uh, one question that really is being directed to both Julian uh, and uh, Machao in terms of the generation of those numbers and the power of them. Esther. Just unmute Esther, please. Thank you, Carol, and thank you to all the presenters. Um, yeah, exactly. I wanted to dive into those numbers because I think you, both you, Matthew and Julian, you very rightfully said or spoke about how important these numbers are and how important it is to generate these numbers and then actually uh, use them for your cause, so to say. So what I was wondering is... Um, if you notice what trail values um, you found to be most influential in making yeah, the case for trails, especially looking at um, yeah, policy representation and support from um, policymakers. What, yeah, so what numbers would you say are the most effective to do so? Thank you. Actually, shall I jump in first? Yeah, I can yeah. do that. So for for us, what we see right now with the type of government we have, so it depends on a few years ago, it was more mental health, physical health, well-being. Now it's job creation, economic impact, and local visitation. So we really craft our messaging based on the elected official that we are meeting with. But trail visitation, the local impact, so what do we have, what the trail is bringing to their constituent in their riding is the key for to convince a politician. After that, the tourism, the other data are good to have, but not a must have. And, and the, the bit I'll add to that is the return on investment. So government puts in or central government puts in about uh, half a million pounds a year into the trail. Uh, we we generate 150 million pounds worth of health benefits, uh, another 100 million pounds going back into treasury. So straight away, that's well over 300 times investment. Uh, and when you start talking those numbers and saying, if you invest another 500,000 into the trail, we can do so much more with it. 
uh, it then starts to open up the coffers. And we've, we've started to see government investing in accessibility over the past two or three years because of those numbers. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, so some in, in salient and important uh, messages for us in Europe, having just gone through a European election and looking at the, the, the representation that we now have across Europe, uh, I think there are some important elements there that we need to learn and reconsider in terms of, as I said, how we reframe how, uh, how we're talking about trails and the, the numbers that we can generate to, uh, to support that. Um, I'm going to move on now, but just to, to let you know, there was a question about uh, the Mentimeter. I've reformulated that so that we can get access to the second slide. And we're going to uh, present that to you just uh, shortly after the next uh, couple of speakers. So hang on for that. You'll get your opportunity to uh, present your, your views and your reflections and your thoughts uh, just shortly. But having, uh, as I said, reflected a little bit on where we are in Europe at the moment, we're going to jump into a really important European organisation, the European Ramblers Association. They've been around for quite some time. And Stine Kobero Hansen, thank you for being a bit of a tongue twister on your name there, um, is one of the board members of the European Ramblers Association and um, really wants to promote sustainable walking and hiking activities across Europe. So Stine, tell us more about the hiking trails of Europe. Thank you. Hi all, good to see you. Um, I'm from Denmark. I'm sitting uh, just north of Copenhagen right now, enjoying the nice weather here in Northern Europe. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the um, about, uh, European Renters Association. And uh, many non-native English speakers don't know what a rambler is, but a rambler is a hiker. Um, and that is uh, also why we will uh, begin to change our name into uh, into something with hiking so people understand uh, who we are because we have existed for 55 years uh, started in 96 uh, five countries and now today we are uh, having 64 organizations from 33 uh, european countries uh, most of them inside eu but also uh, country or member organizations from countries outside eu our focus has always been uh, on these uh, 12 European long distance paths, as you can see uh, on the right side here. But we have also the last 10 years been working on quality uh, around trails. And that is what we call in leading quality trails, best of Europe. And that I will come back to uh, shortly. Um, we are beside that with working with trails. We are also arranging events. Uh, we're having every fifth year a Euro Rando where we are meeting thousands of people in a specific uh, corner. Last time it was uh, Romania, but that was during Corona, so we were only 500. <clears throat> but, but we have been with thousands uh, before. And we are doing conferences and, and seminars, webinars and so on about the uh, way marking and uh, connectivity to nature and so on. So we are trying to do a lot of activities like all the, the other organizations do also. Then we, uh, we have made a European uh, brand for, for walk leaders where they can become certified as walk leaders. And they are, uh, I would say, some, of, some between some and many of our member organizations who are using this brand to train and uh, educate their walk leaders. And then we are certifying the leading quality trails, as I, as I said before. Um, I think I'll jump over this one because Carol has uh, already mentioned uh, this, why we need the hiking trails. I don't think we, we need to jump further into that, uh, but we have written something about it. And you can see the link in the bottom of the, um, this uh, slide here, so you can read more how we see it. Um, also, uh, one thing I, th I think is important here is about the nature that that. Uh, to protect the nature, you must love the nature. And to love the nature, you must uh, know it. And you don't only know it if you are inside the nature. So that is very important that, that, that people who should protect the nature, they also love the nature because else they just say, okay, nature, what is that? So, so uh, that is one of the things I would say about this one. <clears throat> um, we are, we are working with programs that is our permanent activities and uh, one of them, as it has been all the 55 years, are these uh, 12 European paths, uh, which are 75,000 kilometers uh, long in total. 
um, we had established a working group some years ago, and uh, when we when we uh, <clears throat> started that, we found out that the data about our trails was very poor. So we we used more than two years to uh, collect the data from the different member organizations in the countries to ensure that we could we could say to people the e-pass are, are well marked, they are okay to to hike on and so on. And we can see now that they are what we call the verified e-pass. They are they are very uh, popular. Um, and we are also promoting the, the verified e-pass to be used for extended weekends or short holidays and so on. You don't have to walk 10,000 kilometers along the coastline from Tallinn to Trarifa in Spain. Uh, you can also do shorter uh, hikes and so on. Um, the e-pass here, they, uh, they are connecting uh, national and regional trails. We try to put them on top of, uh, of the already existing trails to connect uh, the different, uh, yeah, the other trails uh, that they are following. Uh, and the trails are maintained nationally. Some countries it is by, by the member organizations, uh, other countries is by the municipalities. And the funny thing is we have no money for this. So we do it for no money, or very, very little money uh, to, to, to run the, the e-pass. Uh, about the verified e-pass, uh, um, we ensure that it is a, a rather high standard. It's not the highest standard, but it is the highest standard uh, they have. Uh, <clears throat> and they are they are done. They, we are dealing, we are collaborating with our member organization to, to do this uh, uh, sufficiently. And, um, and these uh, uh, e-pass, uh, they give really unique insights into the regions they are passing through. So, so people can really get a feeling of, of both nature and culture uh, things in the area. <clears throat> uh, we are trying to, to make uh, people uh, detailed route prescriptions so they can follow the route without problems uh, and so on. They can plan the route without problems and so on. And then finally, we, uh, we are also using the verified e-pass for responsible hiking practices. Uh, because in fact, hiking in self is sustainable. Um, the other side of the um, of the uh, trails we are working with is uh, the leading quality trails. We call them LQT in, in daily business, but, but we have had the, the long ones with some more than 50 kilometers. Uh, that's those one to the right. Uh, for more than 10 years, uh, we are having around 25. Uh, uh, these long trails which are certified by us for the highest quality at all. Um, but now we have built up a family uh, also consisting of day walk and, uh, and also region. Uh, and, and for example, National Park Molsbjerge in, in Denmark, they are now working uh, to, to become a leading quality trail region to, to be certified as that. Um, but the, the day walk, they are the short ones below 25 kilometers. They are exploding. We, we implemented them uh, this year and last year. We started uh, making courses and so on. Uh, just We just had a course in Denmark two weeks ago for 20 persons to, 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 so they can learn what are the criteria and so on. And in two weeks time, we go to Belgium to, to teach there. We have courses in Portugal, in Greece and uh, also soon in Czech Republic and so on. Um, the, the, just to show you very shortly what, what such a day walk is. It's normally a, a round uh, a trail, uh, not A to B, but uh, you have to come back to your starting point. And uh, there, the main elements is variety. It's not, you're just not walking on a boring trail. You're, there's a variety. You have to have a good surface. Asphalt is nearly forbidden here. Uh, you have good uh, points of interest you are passing and so on. It can be cultural and uh, natural points and, and so on. Uh, your marking and signposting is uh, excellent. So that is what we are teaching uh, people to do. And this is the, uh, the steps in, the, in this quality process. I will not say the, the, um, the uh, verification or certification is the, is the goal. Of course it is for many because they can use it for, for, uh, for a brand. But the most important is down to the left of this uh, slide here, we are training the local experts how uh, you can think about good uh, experiences, high quality experiences. And there you then have this uh, 
to see the, where you can improve uh, by what you have learned and so on. And if you want to be uh, uh, certified, you can then ask for a certification uh, for us and then we come to, to assess the, the trails. Um, we are we are recommending uh, best things. We we are standing for quality in uh, in era in European Renters Association. So we are trying to to promote the best uh, what we know of, and um, that is of course the verified e pass. Uh, yeah, right now eighty percent of our of our total seventy five thousand kilometers are verified. So they are of a certain uh, quality, but below that, so you can see the leading quality trails, that is the, the trails of highest uh, quality, where we are trying to tell people, and that is also a way to spread people all over Europe. We knew it from, from during the corona, we needed to spread people. Uh, so, so here are also some uh, good ways to give uh, people good experiences at the same time as you're trying to spread them uh, more so they don't are at the same hotspots and so on. Um, our initiatives and ideas in, in ERA right now is that uh, we are working, as you heard before, uh, World Trails Network, uh, Europark 2, we are working on, uh, on something green. Um, and that is what we call right now the green trails. Um, we, we, have, uh, we are trying to establish some criteria for, for the green trails. It started to be a certification system, but after discussions this spring, we are more turning over to a more post certification system, but also an education system. And there, we are having um, we are looking into other systems how we can we can work with this. Um, it started with these uh, criteria, five areas, with three uh, sub criteria inside each of these um, areas. And um, for myself, it started in Iceland. Uh, my wife is from Iceland, and we often travel to Iceland. And uh, we were at, uh, at the Lagovelur Trail last year, and uh, we have been out in, in, the, in the mountains for a week or two. And then we came to the start point, and when we came there, the first words that came out of my mouth was, let's, let's get away from here, because it is completely uh, eroded. There are too much people. It was terrible, as in terrible. So that was the first idea is why we began to, to think about this uh, green trail uh, criteria here. We also cooperating with World Trails Network uh, because uh, they have this uh, green flag trails. So there we are also trying to see if we can put things together in a in a in a proper way. So it started here, but, but uh, we are we are now going more against uh, or towards what I would call a, a broader hike green Europe initiative where we can look into uh, education and so on, that especially education came in fact from Europark, uh, from Teresa and Europark, uh, that we should look not only for, for criteria and so on, but also for, for more uh, so trails, national parks, whatever, whoever uh, could, could use uh, a little bit the same ideas from, from the World Trails Network. They could use the ideas and guidance and so on. So we hope we can put this into a Erasmus Plus project from 25. Uh, to build it up uh, uh, over the next uh, three years, of course, in cooperation and collaboration with, uh, with others who are working on this. Um, this is my last slide. That is the references. Uh, when you get the PDF uh, afterwards, you can, uh, these are links you can see uh, and use here um, what we have been writing about the things. The last thing is I would mention here is also, we are also having a trail conference. Uh, so, so that is in November in, in Paris, where we are trying to talk about sustainability too. And there, Carol and Mike and I, we have talked about to talk about together, how can we, uh, uh, how can we work together on these, uh, I would call it many conferences on trails and sustainability. So that is uh, what I would uh, um, say now. You're welcome to, to come with remarks or questions. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dean. And uh, uh, there's the perfect example there of uh, going into nature and finding a solution. So when you were there in Iceland and uh, it gave you the inspiration for the green trails, just as Einstein, as <laughs> your second uh, important quote of the day, just as Einstein always uh, had said, look into nature and you'll understand everything better. So when we're really puzzling about what to do with our trails, perhaps uh, we too need to get out there and uh, find the solution. 
Um, yep, just checking to, for questions. Sana, I think you have a question for Steen. My, can you hear me? No. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic to hear about hear about the the European trails. Uh, Europe is uh, is very varied. There's a lot of landscapes, cultures, um, uh, countries, uh, and these trails go through through those very 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 varied landscapes and and cultures and everything. Uh, but is there something uniquely European in European trails? Mm. It is, it is unique, and the whole idea was uh, connectivity and unity. They started, uh, the, the people who started it 55 years ago, that was the idea to, to bring people together. Of course, it started in Western Europe because we had a West, Western and Eastern Europe, but when, when the Iron Curtain was falling down, you could see on the map before, they quickly spread to the East. So in fact, that was also a way to connect people who had not been connected before. So, so it is a, it is a, I would say, a unique thing in uh, in the world that we have this uh, in Europe uh, as a kind of connectivity and unity of, uh, of things. And as Carol said, we had the uh, elections here, and I think it is more important than ever that we are using uh, things like trails, for example, to to unite uh, people in some way and not split people. Yep. I don't, I don't know if that was an answer. No, thank you, Steen. And I think that's very well said. Uh, yes, if, if ever again there was a time where we needed connectivity and unity and some peace and understanding in Europe, uh, you know, trails can be the totem, I think, I think for that. Okay, moving on to our very last speaker of the day. We've still got 15 minutes of our allotted 90 minutes time. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mike McClure just in a few moments but again just to remind you after this I'm going to be opening up the menti again so you'll get a chance to have the last word of the day but Mike McClure is the chair of the European Network of Outdoor Sports and a very good partner with Europark and projects and another aspects of work to do with outdoor sports in protected areas and uh, Mike and the guys and girls at uh, the European Network of Outdoor Sports have come up with a, a, a an initiative for the rest of us in Europe to consider. So Mike, I'm going to hand over to you. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Carol. Can, ever, can you see my screen okay? It always, it's worth checking that first before I start talking. Uh, great stuff. So uh, yes, I, I represent the European Network of Outdoor Sports and, and we have a vision and that vision is that we're Europe, uh, we have a Europe where outdoor sports and recreation are accessible for all, fostering health and well-being, nature connection and environmental responsibility. And that resonates so much with what we've heard already. You could actually put the words, a Europe where trails are accessible for all, fostering health and well-being, nature connection, and environmental responsibility. We, we have a charter that all of our, our members sign up to. Um, and I'll not go through all the elements of it, but within that we have access to areas and sites and also environmental awareness and conservation. So these are critical elements. And through that, we have a, a strong partnership arrangement with Europark because we are the people who use your protected sites for our activities. Um, but hopefully we also connect people to nature and connect people to those uh, important habitats. Sometimes the word sports can be a bit off-putting and, and sometimes people think, oh, this is sort of elite stuff that we're talking about. We have adopted the, the European definition of sport, which means all forms of physical activity. So what we're really about is being active in nature. So sport and recreation, we kind of use in, in the one term, uh, really. We are a, a, a really varied organization. Our, our mission is about working together, about taking action together for the sustainable and responsible development of outdoor sports across Europe. Our membership is hugely varied. It, it involves right from ministries of sport through to small sports clubs, international federation like Steen in the European Ramblers are members of our network, um, land management bodies and, and businesses and environmental organizations. So it's a really broad network that we have together. And about a year ago, we, we started talking more about the whole concept of trails and the importance of trails as mechanisms to connect people to nature and get people into nature. And, and we've heard today a lot about why trails are important. So I'm not going to go into the why trails are important, but what we have started to do is work on a European declaration on trails. And this is to highlight their importance, but also to call for their value to be recognised by the EU, 
by member states and other national organizations. Uh, and, and so this piece of work that we're doing, we're not doing it in isolation. It's not just an ENOS, we've initiated it, but our aim is that we do it collaboratively with other uh, member organizations, but also with other partner organizations. So Europark has been a key partner in this piece of work as well. Um, and and it's, a, it's a work in progress. So what I'm gonna show you is where we're at currently. Um, we, we, we haven't got it finalized yet. So the, 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 the principles and the elements of it that I'm showing you are, are still in progress and we will only have a final version in September. So, you know, there may be some changes to this. So just bear with us for, for that. But it gives you a feel for what we're talking about. Within the, the declaration, we, we, we've come up with a, a series of benefits for, for trails, which I haven't gone into because I knew Others in this uh, webinar were talking a lot about the benefits of trails. But then we, we came up with 10 principles for trail development and management. And, and that's a really important sort of framework in which to promote trails. So the first one is really that, um, you know, in natural habitats and especially protected areas, the development of trails should actually be focused on protecting the environment from human activity and encroachment. So yes, it's about engaging people with those environments, but actually trails are really important to corral people into corridors and give nature space to thrive. Um, so, so trails are important for that way. We've all said trails should be open, but there may be times and seasons when restrictions can, can apply. And that really interventions on trails in the natural environment should be the focus. And Steen highlighted this in his that, you know, we're not interested in tarmac things. We, we're, we're looking for minimal intervention so that places still look very natural. Um, and and so, so significant and engineering and landscape modification should not really be the norm um, and should be no substitute for training and technical skills. So, you know, sometimes people want to make things much more accessible and you have to be cautious about saying, and we saw that in the first the first presentation um, on the Lynx Trail, you know, some of those environments are pretty hostile environments. We, we shouldn't engineer those environments to make it easy for people. We need to train people how to be in those environments. Um, but then trail development in urban and peri-urban areas maybe should be about more creating that accessibility for everyone. The, the, the furniture we put on trails, so the way marking and the signing should be appropriate to the environment. So if you're in a real wilderness environment, then that level of intervention should be very low, but in, in, a, in a more peri-urban environment, that level of intervention would be higher with much more signage and information. Um, and that there should be sort of minimum standards on trail width and potential segregation to manage conflict between, between your users, especially in those high usage areas. Uh, we've also said that trails don't need to be restricted to land-based opportunities. I, I live in, in Ireland, and we've been developing, on the island of Ireland, we've been developing blue ways, which are a bit like greenways, but on the water. Um, and it's about access for stand-up paddleboarders and for canoeists and, and rowers um, to be able to access our, our amazing waterways that we have in, in, in Europe as well. So we could potentially look at water trails as part of this. Um, and, and also trails, and again, Steen and Julian highlighted this, trails can be a mechanism uh, for the enhancement and enrichment of ecosystems. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And that there should be mechanisms to, to monitor data, um, particularly in those similar centers. So those are our, our kind of 10 principles that we've looked at in terms of trail development and management. But again, it's a work in progress. I haven't given the full details. There's a lot more information in the document that you'll see whenever it's published. One of the things that we're, 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 we're really focused on is about the opportunity that trails create um, for connecting communities, but also to enrich biodiversity along our riparian zones, our waterways, but also on agricultural land. I often describe it that I can get into my car and I can drive anywhere uh, around the community which I live. In fact, I can get on a ferry in my, and then go in my car and I can drive anywhere to any community in Europe. And yet I cannot walk, I live in a rural community, I cannot walk or cycle to my local shop um, without being on a dangerous road. Um, and, and so we really want to get people to be connected, but also we've got a biodiversity crisis um, and, and creating buffer zones along our waterways and along agricultural land that then have trails within those 
not every buffer zone, but some buffer zones have trails, connect up communities and develops uh, connected environments and habitats. One of the challenges we have in Europe is that uh, we're going to reduce our genetic stock of species because um, species are becoming desertified uh, into little zones where they live and they're not uh, able to interbreed with, with and keep the genetic stock high. So this is something that we're, we're quite focused on within this declaration as well. And when we have a number of um, recommendations that we've produced through the, the, uh, the, the document so far. So, so we have six recommendations for the European Commission um, because we are a European network and although we're a geographical network and we work closely with our other uh, geographical partners like European Ramblers, European Mountaineering Association and Europark, all of us have members who are outside of the, the, European, um, uh, the European Commission area. And so, you know, it's, it's a geographical thing, but we still need to ensure that the European Commission uh, are aware of the importance of trails. And so we've got six recommendations for the European Commission, um, and, and that's to develop and promote trans-European network of trails, to look at having a directive on trails that requires member states to develop trail strategies, um, prioritize and create dedicated resource for regional development, and then to development of green corridors. In terms of resource, one of the big issues, and, and, and Julian highlighted this, um, as did Matthew, is, is there's often money for development of new things, but rarely is there money for maintenance of existing. That can be a real challenge. And with climate change affecting our natural habitats and trails and, and you know, significant weather events, uh, hampering developments and hampering maintenance, um, we really need resource for that. And then we're also saying that there should be a, a special Eurobarometer Euro focused on trails um, to provide up-to-date data. And that could actually be relatively straightforward to produce given the, the digital data that is now available. We've got a, a couple of recommendations for member states, and, and that's that trail management and maintenance should be afforded equal or higher priority to roads and existing night cycle networks by national infrastructure departments. At the minute, everywhere in Europe, the car is king. It's still very much the major resource goes into to on-road transport. And we need to get people, if, we've got a, if we're serious about our climate crisis, we need to get people, especially to make short journeys using trails and using feet or cycleways. And, and also by member states should produce public awareness campaigns and, and educational initiatives about responsible trail use. And, and this is a critical element that, you know, we need to use our, our natural areas and uh, as responsibly as we can. We've got a number of recommendations for local authorities, which is to create local advisory forums to, to get communities engaged with their local natural areas and their, their, their trails, um, to recognise the valuable contribution of volunteers. And, and we've heard a lot about that with, I know European Ramblers, the work they do is phenomenal with uh, using mainly volunteers. Um, and then highlight the potential for trails to boost local economies. And again, we heard about that uh, from our previous speakers. And then one final recommendation at the minute is that there needs to be a, a collaborative discussion on developing regulations for trail data management. There are now a number of uh, digital providers who are providing data on trails um, and, and not all of that is, is legal or it's open and it's user led. And sometimes that creates issues and challenges. So we need to have a conversation about how we manage that going forward. So where we're at at the minute in terms of all of this is we, we've done an initial consultation in, in April and May. Um, we've just closed that consultation. We're doing a review of an analysis of all of the feedback and we got lots of feedback, which is really positive. Um, we, we're going to go out for a, a short further consultation with our own network members because they are very representative of the broad sector uh, of interest in this. And then we'll do a final review and a drafting in August. And we plan to launch the, the Trails Declaration at our own conference in September 2024. So you've got lots of choices of conferences to go to this year. Um, and uh, our conference is going to be in Lecco uh, in Italy. And the theme of our conference is innovations in outdoor sport and recreation, inspiring, sustainable and active citizens. And, and within that, we have three key themes. 
which is about environmental responsibility. It's about health and well-being of communities, and it's about inclusion of people uh, to include more people being physically active in nature. Um, and I've put the link there up and we'll pop the link into the chat as well. And there's a QR code that takes you to the website for the Euromeet. And we'd love to see you at that at that Euromeet where we will be launching the, the trail declaration um, uh, and, and passing it on to the European Commission. Thanks very much, Carol. Thank you very much, Mike. And as I say, if uh, is, there, is there an opportunity for people to uh, invite input or comment into the declaration via our respective organisations? Absolutely. I think that the best way at the minute it would be to feed it back through the, the organisations. So, I mean, we've already had some great feedback from yourselves in your part, but if, if individual members wanted to feed further thoughts back to you, we'll certainly take those on board before we publish the final version. Um, and, and likewise, you know, uh, European Ramblers have already sent us some information and I know they're sending us more. So that's fine. And we will continue the conversation um, until we get the final version. And, you know, we'll, we'll create the declaration and, and we'll promote it. But it may well be it's something that becomes a, a, a living document and, and we update as time goes on. Because let's face it, if we talked about a declaration pre-COVID, it would have been a very different declaration than it is now with the numbers you're accessing the outdoors compared to pre-2020. So I think, you know, things can change. So we, I think we'd keep it fluid and alive. So Europart members or even non-members, if you wish to make Absolutely. contact with us, you've got some thoughts about this European declaration on, on trails. We'd be happy to to hear your views and feed them in to Mike uh, and uh, you know, start this process in Europe. Now, I said you could have the last word. We're a bit of a minute over there, but I'm going to share screen and let's see what you've been saying about trails in Europe. I'm just going to slowly scroll up so that we can read some of the responses. So trails are a very important tool to manage people and visitors. They have the potential to create connective corridors, to connect people to nature, a vehicle to drive transformation. They deliver perhaps CO2 neutral if we use feet, horses or bikes. We can limit impacts through good use of trails and make sure that our invasive species are better managed. And we can keep visitors where we want them to be and keep them out of where we don't want them to be. It's also trails are a great opportunity to see the effects of nature protection and climate change. So it takes people to see what's happening on the ground. Help people to connect with their environment, to allow people to value the environment and provide low carbon travel. By enabling access to nature, we give people the idea that it should be protected. That's the hope anyway. And there are many factors and stages in between that can influence whether this actually happens. But obviously making sure that people have access on a good, well-managed trail, I think is part of that solution. If services are designed climate friendly, then it's the answer for future challenges of sustainable tourism and climate change. Trails deliver visitors Subjects that can represent a helping hand at all levels of politics and land management. Great, some very good responses to what do trails deliver for nature protection and climate change adaptation or mitigation. Um, but just to say, we Herbert reminded us right at the beginning that uh, every trail should have a good start and a strong finish. Maybe not quite as strong a finish as, as I was hoping for there, but um, we certainly had a good start and you will be the strong finishers. Um, numbers are important. We need to get forensic on gathering those numbers and creative and how we craft the messages and communicate them. Uh, working with our communities to develop our trails. We heard about the tramp system and the fantastic new toolbox that's going to come out from the uh, World uh, Trails Network. Um, I'll hopefully bring that back for you when I come back from uh, Canada. Um, 
making sure we're working with partners that community is important. We found that from all the way across the 28,000 kilometer uh, Trek Canada Trail right to the Lynx Trail in deepest, highest uh, Austria. Don't forget those social benefits that uh, Julian reminded, uh, reminded us of and that um, our trails can be good for health, good for regenerative um, economy and for protecting our landscapes. Well, my notes. Um, Something for our European colleagues to think about. Do we need to make sure that our trails in our parks and protected areas are part of those quality trails that the ramblers were telling us about, or regional and day walks? You know, should we be making sure that they have been uh, um, identified as high as a high quality experience for people? Because if it's good for people, it's a good path, it's a good trail, it's going to be good for nature. And remember that when we look into nature, we understand everything better. So. I hope that's inspired you to take to the trails, get off the roads and take to the trails um, this evening uh, and uh, for the rest of your week. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this afternoon. Our next webinar, if you've enjoyed this Europe Park webinar, will be on the 21st of June and there we will be looking at the economics of protected areas. So, yeah, show me the money, guys. So if you want to find out more about that or contribute to that discussion, please join us on the 21st of June at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, thank you to all our speakers for their inspirational, thought-provoking and very informative presentations. Uh, if I could ask the speakers to stay behind at the end of the webinar, just so we can have a little chat. Um, but thank you all for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you everyone for your contributions, for your chat. And we'll show your present your inputs to the mentees uh, with the webinar when it goes online. You can view it again or share it with your friends what you've learned today. So thank you very much, everyone, and bye bye for now.